Okay, well, hello everybody and welcome to another presentation of the online Cold Fusion Meetup. I'm Charlie Earhart and I'll be your host for the next hour or so. And in this edition, our 255th being recorded on Thursday, November 7th, 2019 at 6 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, we've got Dave Ferguson offering his talk, Sequel, I Learned Enough to Break Everything. And so with that, Dave, go ahead and take it away. Thanks very much for being on. And there we go. Hopefully everybody can see that just fine. Yep. And all right. So yeah, thanks for having me, Charlie. Uh, glad to be back. I haven't done one of these in a while. Um, this is a uh, presentation I gave at CF Summit, so you weren't able to make it there. It's perfect for you. And uh, that one wasn't recorded, so this one will be, so even better for everybody. Um, this does have a live poll baked into it, so if you could take a moment, uh, grab that QR code or that URL in the bottom right there, and go ahead and head to that, and uh, you will get the, the poll that will uh, work its way through the presentation as in different parts of this. So, like Charlie said, uh, we're going to be talking about the SQL. I learned enough to break everything. Um, more of a play on words a little bit there, but... Um, it's uh, just going over a lot of SQL stuff that uh, you may or may not have thought about um, when building applications. So, a little bit about myself really quick. Um, I started building web applications a very, very long time ago. Um, Back in uh, Cold Fusion 2.0 is when I started. Um, and uh, a lot has changed since then. <laughs> um, I am uh, one of the uh, people on the content board for Learn CF in a Week, a online uh, course to, for people to learn Cold Fusion from knowing nothing to being able to build an app in a week. Um, I like long clocks on the beach and on the beach and uh, kicking people in the head but not at the same time. Um, I am actually a uh, avid um, fan of combat sports, uh, specifically uh, MMA and Taekwondo. Um, I'm actually uh, just about to be a secondary black belt in Taekwondo and hold multiple state and district championship titles in Taekwondo as well. So, a little bit about what we'll learn CFM Week really quick. Um, we recently reworked the whole thing for the most part from the ground up, um, rewrote all the code samples and into CS scripts to make them more relevant. Uh, we moved all the content to GitHub to allow public uh, content addition and corrections. Um, added a public QA group for those that have questions. Uh, you can go to learncfinaweek.com to figure out, learn all about it. Um, the main thing we did was to make it more um, allowable for the, the public to get into it versus the way it was before where uh, the public really couldn't. Um, interact beyond just viewing the content. They uh, couldn't actually send fixes, stuff like that. So we added all that in. So take a second. Here's the first poll. Who are you? So how much SQL knowledge do you have? So you kind of ga gauge the audience since people can't raise their hands. Since I can't participate in this, I will I will uh, I will say I use Google more than anything for for looking up stuff. Um, I find books to be slightly outdated by the time you get to them, but they still include a lot of good relevant info. So, what databases do you use? Kind of helps me a little bit along the way in some of the aspects coming forth to see. Uh, Anything else? Oh, if you can put in chat what anything else means, I'd love to know what database that is. Postgres. I knew it. I unfortunately don't use that database. Um, a lot of stuff will be relevant to that, but I don't have any examples specifically for Postgres. I'm very sorry. Oh, and if I didn't mention it, feel free to ask me questions along the way. Um, I will tell you I have time at the end for questions, but I'll be more than happy to answer some along the way as we go. So,
we're going to go. We're going to go uh, how SQL Server handles your queries, uh, some uh, way to speed up some CRUD applications, indexes, a lot of the statistics in the database that matter that people don't really look at, and some, uh, some SQL that was really well intended but uh, didn't go as planned. Uh, so, really, why are we all here? Because probably back in the day, you wrote this query and threw yourself a little party. Got excited. Like, yay, I did it. Uh, and you probably thought it was the greatest thing since Betty White. However, fun fact, I know the saying is greatest thing since sliced bread. But Betty White was actually born before bread was sold sliced. So there's a little history and trivia for you. So you're learning more than SQL today. When you're going to get down to it, you just want to deviate and make you not look bad. You want to actually get control of what's going on. Probably think everybody's the same. We can all write SQL. We can all write these queries pretty pretty easily. No, no hard, not hard, pretty simple. However, how'd you know it was the right way? This is where kind of the DBA differs from an application developer kind of sort of, where since that's their world, they know how to write SQL a little bit better. Um, at the same time, application developers want to write applications a little better. So, um, and they've probably read a lot of these books and probably a whole lot more. Um, but what if you did want to go read some books? They take a lot of time. Book reading takes a ton of time. Um, using the average reading speed of about 300 words per minute, some of these books, like when Sam Seek Yourself teach yourself SQL in 10 minutes um, actually takes four hours to go through based on the number of words in it um, if you were reading it nonstop uh, granted it's broken down into 10 minute sections so that's where its name comes from but to read it all the way through four hours and that's it without even doing any lessons in the book um, and then like the other one uh, SQL all in one for dummies that's 10.3 hours of reading so um, yeah that's a lot of reading to do if you want to go learn SQL by reading all the books. But, like I said earlier, I mean, you can always just rely on the internet. Now, no joke, this Reddit post at the bottom there, um, I didn't make that up. Uh, it's actually not Reddit, it's uh, Stack Overflow. Um, I didn't make that up. I actually found that. Um, it was a response to a question about how to do SQL where the approved answer was downvoted 19 times. And the correct answer, actually on the question, if you were read it, the correct answer had zero votes. So remember that when you're reading the internet, that it's not always the accurate answer. More often than not, it probably is in tech forums and people will smack people for the wrong ones, but uh, sometimes, you get these. Unfortunate, but it happens. But just remember, as our good buddy Thomas Jefferson once said, because he can't say it anymore, the possession of facts is knowledge. The use of them is wisdom. So, query execution. Let's talk about how to get all that data just a touch faster. So, what we're going to talk about is, is query, query and execution plans. Um, so this is how the database decides how to go get your data, um, just like um, creating Java stack traces, stuff like that. So they're created for each degree of parallelism, which is how many ways the SQL server can split the query to run on multiple processors. So if it can split it and run it simultaneously down two processors, you will create one query plan for each split so that it can speed up getting the data. Um, and it will find the, the most highly optimized way it can get to the data, uh, making a whole lot of really smart and very fast decisions along the way. So there's a couple different ways to view execution plans depending on your database. Um, Microsoft SQL uh, has a uh, built-in to Management Studio. Uh, Oracle, um, there's an explain plan four right in front of your query and it will dump you out the execution plan. MySQL, if you're using MySQL Workbench, there's a graphical viewer but you can always use explain to get a textual plan just like Oracle. So they kind of look a little bit like this. Um, here's a SQL Server query plan. Whole lot of stuff going on here. Um, 
going all the way down to where it kept the data to all the way up to delivering the data. So these kind of these kind of read backwards from right to left. Um, the right is actually where the data is stored. The left is and how it compiles it down to give it to you at the very end. Here's the same thing in uh, MySQL Workbench. Um, this one reads left to right, a little more logical for here, and um, kind of helps you see how the data fit together, uh, where it goes through. A little less uh, involved here than SQL Server, but still very valuable. And Oracle's is really complex. <laughs> it uses a text output. Um, somebody told me at CF Summit that there is an actual UI for this. Um, I haven't been able to find a screenshot of that UI to put in here. Um, this is the best I can do at the moment. Um, so maybe one day I'll find that and I'll be able to put it in here. So what does a query plan tell you? It tells you how to the path to get to the data, like kind of like a Java stack trace. Um, this image off to the right is like if you're looking at the detail of a piece of the query plan through Microsoft SQL Server, FYI. Um, any index usage used along the way and how it's being used or not being used. It'll actually tell you if there's an index on a table that it would have used but skipped it, which is really useful. And the cost of each piece, um, you'll see on this one, like there's a uh, estimated um, IO cost, estimated operation cost, estimated CPU cost. So all of it is all gives you very finite detail on a query plan itself. And it will actually give you suggestions for making things better. Like if it says it can't use a index and it'll tell you why, or it may tell you it did a table scan here instead of an index here. If you put this index on here, this will run faster. So it gives you a lot of help along the way. And it gives you a whole bunch of other statistical info that you probably don't care about. Um, but there's a whole lot of info there that you can actually dig into. <clears throat> so, Execution plans are kept differently by different databases. Uh, Microsoft SQL and Oracle use a shared cache, which means all user sessions across the database can use the same query plans that are created. So if user A creates one and user B creates one, they both can use it. However, MySQL doesn't cache the query plans at all, unfortunately. Um, it crashes the, it uses a query cache to cache the results, but it actually doesn't cache the query plans, which makes no sense to me. It's just uh, different databases do different things. So, you got all those query plans in cache, but there are some reasons that they will actually get dumped out of cache for the ones that cache them. Um, you can actually write code to force query plans out of cache to make them refresh themselves. You're running into memory pressure or um, running out of memory. Um, running alter statements against your tables, uh, any views or anything that the, the uh, query plan is using will force it to be uh, knocked out, to be rebuilt. And anytime you have statistics uh, being altered on tables, um, and if you have update statistics on, um, anytime that the table has to auto update its statistics, any query plan using that table will automatically be dumped out of cache. So things to notice if you're spending a lot of time generating query plans all the time, some couple things to look at to try and prevent that from happening. So utilizing this plan cache is really crucial on large systems. Um, Couple ways you can actually make sure you utilize the cache a little better. Uh, a, just get more RAM. Get lots of RAM. Much RAM, much RAM as you can stick in that machine. Get it all. Um, use query params, which we'll go over that in a little bit. Uh, use store procedures, those help a lot uh, because they're pre-compiled, uh, kind of like a view, but a little different, a little more logic in them. Um, and they help uh, with uh, reusing, reusing of query plan cache and other cache parts. Um, and I mean, at the end of the day, you can always just use less queries, but odds are you're writing more queries into your applications every day than you are taking out. So the last one's not really viable, but it's just always a suggestion. So execution plans are really great. They help you get to the data, um, but there is a little gotcha. This query is gonna create an execution plan about this query. Doesn't matter how simple or complex your query is, a query plan is always created. So database will create a query plan for this. This query is not going to care and create its own. So these two queries created two different query plans. Odds are, since looking at the simplic simplicity of the query plans, they're both identical. However, they are, for all argument's sake, the query plans are different because um, it creates two different ones. 
Sounds legit, right? The problem here is query optimizers are extremely picky across any database type. Um, these aren't treated as the same query as far as the execution plan and the query optimizers go. They are completely different because when you, if you were to hash this, you get a different hash. They are not an identical hash. How to fix that is using query params. They kind of fix everything. You parameterize the ID, then if you were to take that query, send it to the database a thousand times, hash it a thousand times, you get the same hash every single time. So you can ultimately get the same query plan every single time. So execution plans can cause a little bit less than expected results at times um, if your data structure changes a lot. Um, you will run into issues with uh, the system just regenerating query plans all the time. Um, if you're altering lots of tables, stuff like that, which you hopefully shouldn't be in a live system in a, in a QA or development environment. You, that's probably true, but probably uh, not in a live system. Um, if you have a lot of large volume, data volume growth, uh, log databases, any logging, any big tables that are constantly just getting dumped into large amounts of data, you will always run into issues with query plans because there's going to be statistics changing, indexes changing on a high rate. So it causes the query plans to just get not even used. Sometimes databases will just start uh, ejecting tables or query plans from tables automatically because uh, it knows these tables keep changing too often. And then if you have uh, some data with high degree of cardinality, you run into some issues too. You're probably wondering, what's cardinality? So cardinality is basically just a fancy word for describing uniqueness of data. Um, tables that have high cardinality is uh, columns that are that have very uncommon or unique values like um, email addresses, usernames, phone numbers, very highly unique data. Where low cardinality is uh, like booleans, fl um, flags, major classifications, um, like yes, no, stuff like that. Um, so when you get into the the high cardinality data, you get into a lot of issues with uh, um, query plans trying to be being maintained on some of that data. So if you got a lot of data and you're trying to manage all that data, a couple things to always remember and take into consideration: only return what you need. Don't use select star, and I'll go over some reasons why that is important later. But um, I use select star when I when I'm developing. And then once I narrow down what I'm actually using out of that query, I will take the star away and actually put in the column names of the data I need. Um, that makes everything just run considerably better. So always make sure you're not using select star. Um, if you're going to page through the data, try and do it in the database and not on the application server. The database is really good for handling data and, and small groups of data and paging data. Application servers, not so much. So, and there's a high, high risk that if you're going to load a thousand rows of data to a user in a, in a browser UI, they're not going to look at row 1000. So why churn a thousand rows of data, give it to the user and let it sit there for them to never look at? Um, only get the data out of the database that you're needing and let the database do the paging as possible. Um, optimize indexes to speed up your work clauses. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, avoid using triggers if you're doing large volume inserts. And I mean like, like inserting five tables. I mean, if you're inserting like a thousand rows of data, disable triggers when you do the insert and then turn them back on when you're done because um, it'll make everything go considerably faster. Because when you've got triggers and you're doing big inserts, um, those triggers are causing locks on data and then impacting everybody. So you want to turn them off in a transaction, slam all the data in, turn the trans turn the uh, uh, um index back or the uh, trigger back on at the end of your transaction to make everything go a little quicker. Um, and if you're getting data to the user, try and do everything you can inside the database as best you can. Like if you're going to concatenate tables like a first name and a last name to a full name, do that in the database or as part of the query, as part of select. Um, don't pull it to the UI and then do it there. It's just faster to let the database handle merging data together. Like if you got to do math on a couple columns, let the database do that. It's really good at that. Don't add excess load to your UI or your, your application by having it then do math and other things when the database could do it just, just as fine and give you the, the data return you're looking for. So 
if you're inserting and updating large data sets, like I said earlier about the triggers, um, reduce calls to the database combining, by combining queries. Um, there's one way to do it, and we'll go over an example of that in a second. Um, use any bulk loading features that exist in your database. Uh, different databases have different, different ways to do that. So the more you can use your database to bulk load, the better, because um, it can handle and manage the aspects of loading all the data in. Um, and some databases can actually handle XML or JSON as a data type. So you can actually put bulk amounts of data in a table as JSON or XML and then query it just like you would any normal query. So there's some uh, opportunities there too. If you don't need to parse through the XML or JSON, just need to store it, you can actually just do that instead of parsing it out into columns and rows and putting it in and just leave it as that format and dump it in. Sometimes it's a little considerably faster. So query combining, how to get all that data in really fast. So typically you'd write something like this where you'd create a loop and then put a query inside it and then do your inserts um, looping over the, the insert over and over and over. Well, instead of doing that, do this instead. Um, this, as far as I know, works on SQL Server, MySQL, and Oracle. There's slight alterations to this, um, but this concept works on all of them. Um, so what you're doing is you're actually looping the actual values instead of actually looping the query as a whole. So this creates one single call to the server with a bunch of data in it. It's considerably faster. How fast are you asking? Well, in some sample tests I did, the old way of looping the query as a whole ran at about 800 milliseconds per 2,000 rows. The alternate of bulk loading it in ran at about 45 milliseconds. So considerably faster. Um, however, not everything's faster is better. <laughs> Sometimes speed comes with some inherent dangers. Um, you get one little error in your main load, you could have the whole batch of a thousand or two thousand or a few thousand, whatever you're loading in, fail. Um, I've done batches up to ten thousand in sub second, so this process works really well. But you get one little error in a batch of ten thousand, the whole thing could fall apart, and you got to figure out where it broke and how to fix it, and then get all those data back in. Um, you could overflow the allowed query string size. Some different databases allow a query to only be so big, so you could overflow that. So that's something you gotta watch out for. Um, database, database locking can get a little problematic um, where you run into uh, uh, locking down too many tables trying to load all the data in because then other users trying to access those tables can get impacted so you'll run into some problems there. And a lot of times it's really difficult to get anything viable back as when it's done. Um, so you gotta watch out for that as well. So a couple things to be careful of. But you know, sometimes faster is just faster. Um, by doing it at once, you reduce all the network calls to the database. Um, it's all processed in one single batch, so the, so the database can handle that really, really efficiently. And like I showed earlier, the processing time is, is generally considerably faster by, a, by multiples of magnitude. So indexes. How they make indexes work for you instead of against you. So there's a few index types. There's a unique, a primary key or row ID. Um, every table should have one, whether you need it or not. Every single table you create should have a primary key, period. Even if you give it an ID and it's auto numbered and you never reference it, you should always have one. It helps you later if you have to get one row out of the table or even look at a row. Um, it gives the, the database a way to anchor into that data a little bit. Um, clustered or IOT indexes, um, these are actually the way the data is physically stored in order. Um, a table can only have one for SQL Server. Um, Oracle can have multiples, but SQL Server can only have one. It actually creates an index in the actual the order of the way the data is in the database. You have a non-clustered index. It only contains index data with pointers back to the source data. Um, this one is slightly slower. I mean, by slightly, I mean it's it's almost unmeasurable slower than a clustered index. Um, but you can create a ton of them. There's really almost no limit to the quote unquote no limit to the amount you can create. So you can create a bunch of them, which makes it uh, these are a lot more useful in that aspect. 
Then you create what's called a covering index. This is where you make everything go faster. A covering index is an index where you've indexed columns in the order in which you're in the, in an order that matches your where clause in your query. So if you're doing a query against a user table and you want to find users where um, first name e or first name equals X, last name equals X, you would have a covering index where your columns in your covering index would be first name and last name in that order. And you could have other ones along, but if it finds an index where it has those in that order starting in that order, it will use that index every single time more often than not, which will make it super quick. Um, anytime it, you try and do multiple um, where's in a query and there's no covering index, uh, you will run into issues where it has to then start manipulating multiple indexes to get to the data. And then sometimes SQL Server will just not use the indexes at all because it, it has to try and piece together too many indexes to get to the data, where a covering index solves that problem. And it indexes the data across multiple columns to make all your data access super quick. So what kind of data should be indexed? So do index large data sets, where you're looking at tables where you're generally returning 10 to 50% of the data, not to a single person, just in general. Um, columns where, columns used in where clauses where there's a high degree of cardinality, like email addresses. You want to index an email address column because every single one is going to be unique. So if you create an index on that, it's going to help everything uh, uh, be faster. Just like a, a username columns, anything where all the data, almost every single piece of data that's going to be unique and you're going to actually use it in a where clause. Like if you're, um, if you're not, if it has a unique data but you're not using it in any where clause, there's no reason to index it. It's, it's all the columns that are unique that are going to be in a where clause. Don't index. Tiny tables. Um, even if you put an index on a table that only has a couple hundred rows in it, um, or even less than, more often than not, SQL Server is going to ignore the index altogether because it's just faster to go to the table itself because there's not enough data to deem an index reliable um, or necessary because the index could just become out of date. It uh, doesn't really need it. We don't even care about it. Um, columns with low cardinality, uh, for example, like a true-false column, don't index it. It's not going to help anything. It's going to th slow things down. Um, unless you're putting it in a um, in a covering index. Um, if it's part of a covering index, you kind of want to index it. But if, if it's not, don't index it by itself. Um, and the kind of thing with the low cardinality, you, any column with a, only a couple of values, like a 1, 2, 3, is your possible column data in these columns, don't index them. You're going to run the same problem where SQL servers or any server uh, indexer is just going to ignore them because there's not enough data to be indexed and not have different varied amounts of data to index it. It'll create more data for indexing than it will the actual data itself. So getting to the using the indexes are a couple of different ways that that occurs. One is an index scan or table scan. Um, this one touches all the rows and it's only useful for small tables. These are the ones you want to avoid. Uh, index scans and table scans are really costly on the overall grand scheme of uh, the cost of a query, they are the most hurtful to performance. An index seek is the one you're really looking for. It only touches rows that qualify, and it's really good for highly uh, good data sets, highly selective queries. Um, those are the ones where you want to make sure you're always seeking through indexes, not scanning. Um, scanning, it's, it's a lot faster to go through index seeking. And like I said before, um, even with an index, the optimizer still may opt to perform a scan, even though you, it's, there's a good seekable index on it. It just may go and say, your index um, is not viable for what I'm doing. I'm just going straight to the table to, and do a scan on it, which is unfortunate, but it does happen. So you're probably saying, does my table need an index? It depends, really. It all depends on the data you've got, the queries, different aspects. Um, a, lot, a lot is involved in deciding whether or not you need an index. Um, the best thing you can do is look at your um, your query plan viewers and run your queries and they will tell you if your table really needs an index or not. Um, they'll give you all the hints you need to figure out if you need an index. So rely on that as a, as a good barrier if you're learning what to and not to index. So Let's take a look at some of the stuff that the DBAs don't like to tell us because they want to keep their job. So a few performance impacts on a system. Um, you got processor load, which is how much the processor is doing, uh, memory pressure, 
hard drive, uh, I.O., and the network. So the processor. Uh, first thing I always tell everybody, make sure you give SQL Server process CPU priority. Uh, more, I've seen plenty of server, um, Charlie may have seen this himself, um, where SQL Server is not running right. And one of the things you look at is the CPU for SQL Server was not, was not given priority. So a lot of just general server um, CPU operations are taking precedence over what SQL Server is trying to do. So if you give it priority, it will run all its stuff first. Um, the processor will allow it to push, basically jump ahead of the line every time, it, every every chance it gets. Um, watch for other processes on the server using excessive CPU cycles. Uh, see what it is, shut them down if you have to. Um, Windows machines uh, are common for this, where there's a lot of services running, and a lot of times you don't even need some of those services, and they're just there. Um, and it's probably not just a Windows problem, it's a server problem in a whole. Make sure you're shutting down services you're not needing, not using, that are eating up processor time because that's valuable resources that uh, your uh, your database should be having. Make sure you've got enough cores. So if you're running a whole ton of database stuff, make sure you've got enough cores to handle all your activity. You're trying to keep in from my 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 position, my perspective. Charlie may have a different. I know he deals a lot with. Uh, um, uh, Fine tuning stuff like that. So his his maybe his thought may be different on this, but mine is you always want to try and keep your processor load to below 50% um, to allow the system to spike. So make sure you've got enough cores to keep your load at 50% or lower, so that when you spike, you don't plateau at 100% because then the system can't do anything else. So you want to keep your spikes so they don't spike your CPU to 100%. You want to keep those spikes from going all the way up. Processor RAM, get a ton. Just however much RAM your database server can hold, just load it. Just load it up. Give it all the RAM it can take. RAM is really cheap nowadays, and it's probably the biggest bang for the buck you'll get on a server. Next to solid state drives. We'll talk about that in a second. Make sure you've got enough RAM to keep your server from doing excess paging. A lot of servers I've seen, they uh, end up paging out to a page file um, because they're RAM starved. Um, you can fix that by just adding a ton of RAM. Um, and try and keep it from doing that. Um, also, make sure your database is actually configured to use the RAM in the machine. I've seen this plenty of times where the SQL Server is running 64 gigs of RAM, yet the SQL Server is configured for 8 gigs. So you've got all that RAM sitting there doing nothing. And people are wondering, why, why is my database running so bad? It's like, well, maybe you should reconfigure your database. So make sure it's configured to use the RAM, not all of it, a good portion of it. Got to give a little room for the OS and other things, but make sure your SQL Server is using all that RAM that you put that that you put in the server. Um, if you possible, um, make sure your database is using the RAM for cache. Sometimes you can actually configure databases on where to put the cache. If you've got RAM extra and you can put the cache there, it's going to make everything even faster. Um, and like like with CPUs, make sure uh, if other processes are using excessive RAM uh, to shut them down or find out why. Maybe they have memory leaks, so on and so forth. Um, try and prevent everything else from eating your RAM that's, that you're trying to reserve for the database. So drive IOs. Um, a, I, the drive IO is generally the largest bottleneck um, because it involves a moving part, a spinning drive. Nothing else has a moving part. Um, moving... Uh, Spinning disks can only perform one operation at a time. So you run into a, a bottleneck there. Um, solid state's a little different. They can still only perform one operation at a time, but they can perform one operation super quick compared to a spinning disk. Um, make sure that you don't run out of drive space for your database. Um, make sure you're constantly purging out your log files um, and your transaction logs. Um, I've seen plenty of database that are completely hosed because they uh, configured their database for infinite growth and their log files for infinite growth with no cap and ran out of drive space. And their transaction log, transaction log became full. They were unable to do anything with the database. They had to do a whole lot of tricks to get past the fact that their database was plugged due to a uh, um, overflowed transaction log. So make sure you set your transaction log to, uh, to not be infinite growth. Give it a max. If you can, don't store 
don't store your log files and your database files in the same physical drives. Because um, like I said, the drives can only do one thing at a time. So if you're trying to read and write data and read and, and write log data um, at the, on the same physical drive, something's got to give. So make sure you're trying not to do both of those on the same physical drive. Um, and a lot of people do this, and I always tell people don't. Um, don't put your database on your C drive on Windows. Um, because now you're fighting for resources against the OS. Uh, so don't do that. And if you want to restore, it's a whole lot harder to try and restore when uh, all your application, everything is sitting on your C drive versus another drive and the OS is on its own. Always keep the OS on its own drive. It's a lot cleaner and easier later to restore if the, the OS is residing by itself. If you can, use SSD drives, not just for TempDB, but everything. They're a lot more viable nowadays than they were in the past. They are super quick, not as quick as RAM, but way faster than spinning disks, and they will speed up things tremendously. It's like night and day difference when you drop an SSD into a system and go, holy cow, look at how fast things became. And solid states aren't that pricey. I mean, they're a little pricey, but they're not. The, the amount of cost is outweighed by the performance increase you'll get out of them. A um, couple things for configuration. Um, log drives, wherever your log is being stored, if it's on its own drive, make sure that's in right priority mode. Remember I said that drives can only do one thing at a time? Logs are most just straight right. So you want to put it in right priority mode so all rights take precedence. And, we'll, and writes go faster. Um, and the inverse, wherever you're storing your data, your actual database file, um, that should be in read priority mode because more often than not, you're reading from a database than writing. Um, so if it's in read priority mode, all your data reads will come out faster. Um, your, your writes won't be slower, they'll just be, the reads will give, be given precedence. So it'll make the reads a little faster. So a couple little pieces about the network. Um, it only matters, network only matters if your app and DB are on a separate machine, and they should be. Unless you have a really, really, really small system, always keep your database and app server separate uh, because you don't want them fighting for resources like database or uh, drives. Um, you don't want them fighting for drives, memory, processor, all that stuff. You want to make sure they're, they're can each do their own little thing. Uh, our NetMe SQL Server back. Went from two, yeah, two hours to five minutes. Yep, yep, I've seen stuff like that. Yep, it makes everything go considerably faster. Uh, if you can minimize network hops between servers, the less hops, the better. Um, hopefully, they're sitting side by side in the same rack, and it's just basically a, a hop from a, uh, from a hub and back. Um, but the minimi minimize the hops. Don't have your SQL server, and I've, oddly enough, I've actually seen this, and it was kind of weird. Their application server was on one coast. Their database server was on a completely different coast. Um, and it wasn't a DR disaster recovery scenario. It was actually configured that way because um, they didn't want to set up two different database servers, one local, one disaster recovered across the country. They just put the database across the country. Um, so their app ran really, really bad um, because the speed of light is only so fast, you can only move data so fast no matter what. So they had a lot of hops and a lot of network latency between the two. Um, but yeah, try and keep them as, as close as you can as possible. Um, Watch for network spikes that slow data retrieval. A um, little harder, you may need some a uh, little more uh, software to run that, but watch for those. Um, only retrieving the data you need, like not using select star, um, will make this go a lot faster. Will uh, speed up data retrieval from this uh, from the database. Uh, split network traffic if you can on your NIC card. Um, so on your app server, install dual NICs. Have one NIC just dedicated to SQL Server traffic and the other one dedicated to everything else. Because you don't want somebody trying to upload a giant file to your server and slow down your network to a point where you can't even read your database. So kind of keep those split um, if possible. And um, if you're loading a ton of data back to the client, you can definitely have a large impact on, on network performance. So try and minimize that as best you can. So offloading and caching. Use a secondary database for reporting, if at all possible. Um, more often than not, when people are running reports, they don't need that data real time. They can generally survive with getting that data an hour old, or 20 minutes old, or 30 minutes old. Um, so if you can take your data and push it to a secondary server for reporting, that will speed up your primary database considerably, because 
Reporting is generally one of the hardest things a database has to do. Store static lookup data like country, states, zip codes, data that just doesn't change on the local application server using something like Redis, SQLite, Couch, Mongo, your flavor of light databases. Um, don't use your big giant super database um, to store the list of countries or states that generally doesn't change. Do your best to catch to cache app data on the web server that doesn't change, like configuration data. You may have a table in your in your SQL server that has the configuration of your app, so you load it, cache that. Don't keep getting it every time. Anything you need to get every single time that doesn't change, cache it on your on your app server. Make things go faster. Some important fun statistics to look at: uh, recompiles. Um, these are these are on all database types. They just may be named slightly different. So all these will be the mostly the um, the SQL Server names for them. But all databases kind of have these in some aspect or another. Uh, so recompiles. It's basically a recompile of a stored procedure when when while it's running. Um, shouldn't really happen, but it does, and it's usually caused by a code in the uh, some code in the store procedure or memory issue so if you're seeing those find out why and, and alleviate them there's this fun little statistic called a latch weight um, most people have never even seen it heard of it or know even what it does it is a super low level lock inside the database for the database trying to attach to data for indexing and other things um, it should be sub 10 milliseconds um, I've actually seen databases come to a crawl because this latch weight was up to 20 milliseconds. So it's a very, very important thing that should be super, super, super quick. Um, and any fluctuation upwards uh, causes a lot of problems. Uh, lock weights. Uh, look at statistics on these. Um, these are any. These are uh, caused by one thread waiting for a lock to clear. Um, the more lock weights you have, the more data locking you've got going on, which is causing backup on your re data retrieval or uh, your CRUD operations. So you want to look for those and find out why you're getting a lot of lock weights. Um, full scans. You want to look and see how many full scans you're having. That means indexes aren't being used properly. So um, you want to look at those and try and clean up those, those uh, aspects as best you can. Few things that are Oracle specific for those of you who are Oracle. Um, there's a lot of statistics across the way for tables, columns, indexes, and system that you can pull directly out of Oracle. That's Oracle specific. So um, these are good to look up if you're if you're using Oracle. Some other fun important stats: cache hit ratio. Basically, how often the database is actually hitting the cache versus disk. It should be high on the cache and low on the disk. Desk rewrite times. Um, how fast it's getting data in and out of the out of the drives. If you're using solid state, this should be super quick. If you're using spinning disk, um, this is gonna be slower. But if you're using spinning disk, you wanna watch these times. If they start to slow down, that means you're starting to have problems with your hard drives. Like you're you're running into bad sectors, so there's less and less space. The drive's gotta figure out where it can write data, stuff like that. So if your access times are slowing down and you have spinning disk, you use something you wanna look into your hard drives themselves or anything along the way between to the hard drive. SQL processing, like I talked about, or watch the SQL processor load, memory, remember to make sure uh, you got enough memory, it's all being used properly. So, having learned all of that, let's take a look at some good ideas that have possibly gone off the rails. And if you still don't have the poll up from before, um, there's the URL again, so we can... Uh, do some more audience participation. Let's see how this goes. So, what's the issue with this query? See how much you've learned along the way. And I will, I will give you a hint, there's nothing syntact syntactically wrong with it. It works perfectly fine. It's just not the right way to do something. And yeah, the select star is actually the problem. Um, the reason I said this a, month, a few times along the way, select star is a bad idea. Um, the reason why you don't want to use select star is let's say when you wrote this, these this art and sales tables had like four columns each, no big deal. 
let's say somewhere down the road, a year down the road, you've got thousands of rows in each table joined up. Your query is now returning tons of data, so on and so forth. Um, and let's say somebody decides along the way, you know what? I think we need to start storing thumbnails of the art in the database as blobs or any version thereof for your specific database type. So now you've got that binary data sitting in the database too. If you're doing select star, you're going to start returning all that. And let's say this query doesn't even use it. Let's just using the name or something coming back from this query. So now you've got a query returning a blob of data, a binary chunk of data, which could be megs in size, that's not being used. So that's where this comes into, into play of why it's bad. So it's more, select star is more for future proofing than anything. So that anybody adds a column along the way to these tables, it's not actually pulled back. And the other fun part that could actually break here is let's say art and sales on, on inception had columns that were completely different. And let's say somebody down the way put a column in one of the, in let's say the sales table that was the exact same name as the art table, this query would start failing because now you have a table named collision. So there's a lot of different ways that this could start going bad. That's why some of the reasons that select star is not the optimal way to do things. Good for development, not good for production. So no poll on this one, but here's an example of an inline query that really shouldn't be. Um, I There was a whole lot more going on with this. I actually sucked this out of a system. I was like, holy cow, that's a great example of something that shouldn't be there. So I grabbed this. I gutted a lot of it for uh, to protect the guilty or innocent, depending on perspective. Um, and uh, this just really wouldn't wouldn't be good as an inline query um, because the database, any database, will not be able to create a query plan for this. It'll create one for the first run and it's never going to use it ever again. doesn't matter if you have parameters in here or not. It just can't use it. Um, there's too much going on. The declares, the selects, the sets. There's so much going on in here that you would never want this to be an inline query. It's highly inefficient from a SQL perspective. This should be something that should be a store procedure or a view or something inside the database, not an inline query. So, next one. What would actually happen here if we were to actually run this query or run this piece of code? What would happen? Yeah, in yes, there definitely it, there there is no data source in the query tag. However, that's not wrong. Um, it'll still work uh, in newer versions of Cold Fusion. You don't need to add the data source to the query tag. It can actually be defined in the application. Um, however, the actual problem here is that it's the wrong way to get the ID. Hundred um, percent. The reason being is well, if it's not wrapped in a transaction, but even still, that wouldn't help this. What's happening is let's say you insert this insert this and you're using scope identity to get the ID that was created. However, that's the scope ID is the right thing to use. However, it's going to get you the last ID of whatever was inserted. Um, in this occurrence, you could actually get the ID from a from a different table um, if something happened in between. Um, also, it's possible that if the table you're inserting to, in this case my table, has an index or a trigger on it that doesn't insert, scope identity will actually give you the ID of the triggered insert and not the insert into my table. So this is not the right way to do it. What you actually should do is use some query combining techniques and put select scope identity insert in, into the query itself. However, the other better way to do it actually is in newer versions of Cold Fusion. Um, I think 2016 added this. Um, you can actually give a um, result variable to the query and it will give you back the ID inserted um, without you doing anything other anything special. It's probably the more optimal way to pull that off because then it doesn't doesn't matter what database you're using it's always coming back the same way. So let's just break everything. So take a look at this and give me an idea what you think's wrong. I think this one allows for multiple answers too. If I recall correctly. No, it doesn't. Maybe it does. 
No, it doesn't. What do you think is wrong? So running a query, uploading a file, processing an image, upload, updating some data, inserting a log. What could possibly go wrong here? So, yeah, somebody actually nailed it right on the head. Um, the actual issue here is actually the transaction. Um, the transaction itself is actually going to cause multiple problems in this in this sequence of events. So what we've got to start with is we've got a transaction with an isolation level of serializable, um, which basically basically means any data I touch, lock it down for me and me only. Um, you can allow um, dirty reads, but you can't do you and uh, it will allow uh, phantom inserts and phantom records, um, which are problematic in themselves. Um, so really quick, phantom records are, let's say this, if this query was supposed to return 100 rows um, and you inserted a, a record in the process, um, that would be part of the select. It's a phantom record that's uh, not part of the query, but part of the query all at the same time. Um, so you want to, that's what the transaction level will cause. So if you did a pull of data and then try to do an update, um, you would not update that phantom record or potentially could update that phantom record when you didn't mean to. So what we're doing here is we're getting a whole bunch of stuff. So anything where we touched uh, from the documents table. So we're going to create a massive amount of locks in this document table where the document name equals whatever this was. We're going to upload a file, which is not that big a deal, but then we start processing the image to make it a different size inside a database transaction, mind you. Um, then we're going to update the documents table, again, creating more locks. And then we're going to insert into the upload log, creating even more locks. Um, all, all of this locking down these three tables pretty hard, um, mostly locking down the documents table while we upload and process an image. Let's say that the image is a couple hundred megs. We got to churn it. That could take uh, seconds, um, upwards a minute, uh, possibly longer. Um, in that entire time, the documents table, a lot of its rows get locked down which make uh, trying to do any other process against those tables really difficult, uh, problematic, and could potentially start throwing errors, deadlocks, uh, some crashes, stuff like that. It gets really, really, really problematic. Um, for me personally, I never like um, setting locks on the CF side. If I need to do locks and stuff like that, I'll always do it in store procedures on the database side. Because um, I've run into issues where, let's say I have this transaction, I create a lock, and let's say somewhere along the way, along the chain in this process specifically, let's say I lose connection to my database somehow or something crashes, something on the CF server dies. Um, a, the application server is not able to send a disconnect signal to the SQL server. So what you would end up with is you would end up with a, a phantom lock where you have a lock on these tables with no owner to the lock anymore. So there's really no way to kill the lock except for going into SQL server and running kill commands on SPIDs to to clean up all your locks. So since there's so many different ways you could actually lose connection to the SQL server and stuff like that, I'm never really a big fan of uh, putting locks on the application side. I, like I said, I like to do that on the database side itself. So yeah, do this, just don't do it this way. So having learned all of that, as I get to the final part of my presentation here, Charlie, um, go forth and be your own hero. Hopefully you learn something because this kid is out there and he's there to ruin your day. He's not here to make friends. My little friend Bobby drop tables. <laughs> and that is my end, Charlie. We're going to give people that chance to do the vote. Yep. All right. <laughs> Hot dog is not a sandwich. <laughs> so 
folks, you can see now, uh, and, and Dave, you can see the chat there. There wasn't too much along the way. I think you've addressed everything that came up, and then everybody else can take a look at the last email. Mark. And if you have any other questions now for Dave, now would be a good time. You are very welcome. Yeah, any other questions? I'd be more than happy to answer the next few minutes we've got. Yeah, let me ask you a question, Charlie. In your um, in your uh, troubleshooting stuff, have you seen a lot where people misconfigure databases a lot? Well, <clears throat> what I see a lot is, like I said in my chat there, people who have other things in say SQL Server, especially, leave the memory set to the default. Which, if you've ever looked at it, if you go into the yeah. SQL Server Management Studio and right-click on the server name and then go to the 